Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Lisa Wymore, and I am the faculty advisor for Berkeley Arts and Design here uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, which is uh, arts and design is now part of the larger discovery initiative here on campus. I am welcoming you to tonight's event, Judith Butler and Mel Chen on gender, pandemic time, new time. Uh, in conjunction with the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive exhibition entitled New Time, Art and Feminisms in the 21st Century. I'm so excited about this uh, Monday speaker series, which is supported by the Office of Berkeley Arts and Design, which connects and fortifies creative departments and units throughout the Berkeley campus and beyond. Funds for these talks are made possible by A&D and its generous philanthropic donations. Um, from donors. Unique to the speaker series is its connection to the course Humanities 20, offered through the Division of the Arts and Humanities. 50 students are enrolled in this class and attend weekly talks. Welcome class. Um, this semester's theme is perseverance, renewal, and reflection. Before we begin, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement. We recognize that tonight's event is located in the territory of Huichin, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Chocheno speaking Ohlone people, specifically the confederated villages of Lushan. The history of prolific artistic and technological advancements and development in this region has always been dependent on this land. Berkeley Arts and Design is committed to supporting the sovereignty and ongoing stewardship of this place. Uh, by the Ohlone peoples through building long-term reciprocity and relationship with tribal leaders and organizers. I will now pass, uh, pass it over to my esteemed colleague, Sherry Goodman, who is the BAM PFA Director of Education. Thank you, Lisa, and welcome to this discussion with Judith Butler and Mel Y. Chen, presented in conjunction with the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archives exhibition, New Time, Art and Feminisms in the 21st Century, which is on view at BAM PFA through January 30th. Their conversation titled Gender, Pandemic Time, New Time, takes as its point of departure an earlier one that appears in the exhibition catalog and which they're updating to reflect a transformation of time in relation to gender in the interim. New Time was organized by Apsara de Quinzio, former BAM PFA Senior Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art, and Phyllis C. Wattis Matrix Curator, together with Curatorial Assistant Claire Frost. The exhibition examines recent feminist art through eight different themes, one of which, Gender Alchemy, was highlighted in a major review of the exhibition in yesterday's New York Times. What we're looking at is an installation shot of this section with glimpses from left to right of work by Zanelli Maholi, Caleb Lindsay, Nikki Green, and Wu Tsang. New Time presents over 75 artists and collectives and spans several generations, mediums, geographies, and political sensibilities. The exhibition looks expansively at different kinds of feminism in a period when feminism has been increasingly imbued with class, racial, and gender differences. And it looks inclusively at gender with artists who are cisgender women, trans women, non-binary individuals, and even a few men. Now to our presenters. <laughs> Judith Butler is Maxine Elliott Professor Emeritus in the Department of Comparative Literature and the Program of Critical Theory at UC Berkeley. And this fall, also a distinguished visiting professor in philosophy at the New School University. Butler, an internationally renowned gender theorist and philosopher, is highly influential in the fields of political philosophy, ethics, third wave feminism, queer theory, and literary theory. They're the author of many groundbreaking books spanning from Gender Trouble, Feminism, and the Subversion of Identity in 1990 to The Force of Nonviolence in 2020. Mel Y. Chen, a former student of Butler's, is associate professor in the UC Berkeley Department of Gender and Women's Studies and director of the Center for the Study of Sexual Culture. They're the author of Animacies, Biopolitics, Racial Mattering, and Queer Affect, and are currently completing a book titled Chemical Intimacies, 
about intoxication's role in the interanimation of race and disability in histories and legacies of the transnational 19th century. Elsewhere, Chen has written on slowness, gesture, inhumanisms, cognitive disability, and method. They're part of a small and sustaining queer trans of color arts collective in the San Francisco Bay Area. Mel and Judith will now engage in a conversation uh, followed by uh, time for some questions. Uh, please submit them via the Q&A box. Uh, thank you, and now Mel and Judith. Hello, Judith. Hello, everyone. Hi, hey, Mel. Hi. Um, I just thought I'd open with some um, words of gratitude. I wanted to thank Berkeley Arts and Design and the Berkeley Art Museum for having us in this series. Uh, I wanted to also thank Apsara de Quinzio, Sherry Goodman, Paris Kotz, Dave Taylor, and Justine Castro, and all the artists in the show for making this event possible. And Judith, thank you for your time um, today and, and always. I'm speaking from the unceded territory of Huchen, otherwise known as Oakland, California. Um, I also wanted to add that for our conversation, we didn't want to rehash the, the published conversation we have in the catalog for the show. Um, so instead we chose to discuss um, pandemic time as a focal theme for today. And so in association with that, we'll be talking about a few of the images from the show. Oh, and I uh, wanted to self-describe those uh, for those who are uh, listening today. I have short hair and glasses. I'm wearing a gray shirt. I'm sitting in an office bedroom with a bookshelf to my left and um, the natural light at this moment is waning. Judith? Um, I'm very pleased to be here. I want to thank Bamfa and all the various people who brought us together. It's always a pleasure to speak with Mel and, um, and, to, and to learn from Mel. Um, I am uh, sitting in a rented apartment in New York City and the sun is long gone. Um, it is late. I am tired, but here I am. Um, New York City belongs to the Lenape people, as you may know. And um, we will talk a little bit further on today about dispossession and its historical reverberations. Um, we have a problem before us. How do we think about time? Uh, what, what does it mean to talk about new time? Is there old time and new time? I, I know how to talk about the past and the future. I, I'm not sure I understand the kind of time that we call new or the kind of time that we call old. Um, the title of the exhibition, though, asks us to consider new time in relationship to feminism and art. Um, the title was, of course, provided before the pandemic, so we might say it was a new time prior to the pandemic time, which, of course, makes that new time old. Um, but maybe um, the title names uh, um, a time that is past that was new or was anticipated to be new from a certain point in time um, and is now at a distance from the one we now live. That doesn't mean there's no connection between them, but it seems to me that at the time the exhibition was conceived, and I hope I'm right, I may be wrong, um, it anticipated a continuity between the time of conception and the time of exhibition. Um, but these turn out to be two very different times caused in part by enormous delays, as we know, as Bampa closed and as so many art projects were put on hold. Um, but the title, the title as it comes to us now, opens up this question of incommensurability. What happens if one time and another time are not the same and there's a gap that opens? What do we call that gap? It seems to be part of time. I'm not sure it's new. Perhaps it's recurrent. What if, in fact, as we may well suggest, the new time uh, in which we arrive uh, still within the pandemic, but in one of its variations, if not variants, um, what if that new time uh, is one in which archaic and lost forms uh, of time are coming to life? 
So we hold on to this question about archaic resumptions. And I think in our further thinking, we're also kind of coming to realize that we can't predict, um, and certainly the cur curator could not predict what temporal world the show would appear into. Um, we're also thinking about the ways in which every being in the pandemic is being in time in its own way. And so it's important to mark here that there is no single pandemic time. There are only pandemic temporalities, which we might choose to mark as such or become palpable as characteristic of this current COVID-19 pandemic. And as for the phrase new time, or maybe we could call it not same time, the trained cynic in me asks, well, what's new, what's novel? As many of us notice that what's presented as novelty was already invented or sustained. Those who live under undue burden in the pandemic see these undue burdens happening yet again, perhaps with greater intensity. In the strange economic world of the SF Bay Area, this is exemplified by an article I saw a few years ago in our local paper, which announced that the tech bros of Silicon Valley had invented collective living to afford the costs of their multi-thousand dollar apartments. Wow, I had no idea. <laughs> And also I learned in, you know, that the flourishing in this last decade of um, nationwide of municipal zoning laws to limit poor and immigrant families from having too many people in their households is to be judged in entirely different terms in other temporalities than not new. This goes to queer and trans of color, non-binary, lesbian and gay collectives that are rich in the history and present of this place. It's also worth saying that if change is integral to life and non-life alike, there are never not novelties. So then the question becomes for us, what quantification or what threshold or what failed memory or what erasure of immigrants and black and indigenous people and people of color, what limited scope of modernity, for instance, makes it possible to imagine the arrival of a new. So it's with these questions that I sit with Judith's question about archaic forms. These are open questions and we, as, as we've seen, highly subjective ones. Thank you, Mel. We're also tasked um, with talking about gender and pandemic time, um, uh, but perhaps we should start by trying not to make the mistake of thinking that gender only means women, or that women only means those assigned female at birth. The point, of course, um, here and in the exhibition and in our thought um, is not simply to examine the representations of women uh, in or outside of pandemic time, nor do we, I think, wish to consider pandemic time exclusively along the human axis. Um, Maybe pandemic time has, um, has moved the human off its axis in some ways that we need to consider. Um, one question I have is what, what forms of community have dissolved and what kind have formed uh, during this time, a time that continues despite its variations and its variants. Of course, there are many proclamations the pandemic is over or the world is reopened, but these are, I think, manic denials of the fact that indeed we have ongoing illness, contagion, and um, a lack of, of uh, effects of effective vaccination in different ways throughout the world. Um, very mindful of the fact that certain countries have not seen a vaccination or that uh, major countries like Nigeria, Tanzania, um, have seen very, very few, South Africa as well. Um, in any case, sometimes at least, and here I'm thinking about the visual um, representations we are looking at today, sometimes we only come to know what we call a time, the time that is ours or a time that is past or a relationship among those times through spatial configurations, um, infrastructures destroyed and improvised uh, uh, the non-human animacies with which the human becomes ever more closely bound or lives in proximity to. So let's not uh, go back to imagining that there's some version of women's time 
um, or that for some marvelous reason, Chinese women knew it best. Those days are, I think, probably over. Um, temporalities are, of course, multiple. Um, and many of them act as if they are the only possible temporality when in fact their claim to exclusion is an instrument for effacing other uh, co-terminous um, temporalities. The ideal of a, a matriarchy of old and original matriarchal power, uh, uh, an origin and peaceful coexistence associated with feminine principles or the association of feminine principles with the earth is I think no longer quite plausible as an imagination of our time, um, of the origin of our time and origin um, to which we long to return. I'm not sure any of us do wish to return to that time. Maybe some do, maybe I'm being unfair. Um, that longing, um, is not so common in this time. And yet I certainly uh, was exposed to the longing for matriarchy um, as a young person and sat in many consciousness raising groups where that was actively discussed. Um, perhaps we should consider them first, uh, Candace Lynn's failed matriarchy created in 2008. It's a picture that all too readily recalls feminist arguments <laughs> We have known. I'm wondering if we can we can bring bring that up. All right. So this is um, one of the works in the show. We wanted to focus for our beginning image um, on a 2008 work by Candice Lynn, and this is um, watercolor and ink on paper. I wanted to just give a bit of audio description for those who are listening. Um, the color tones are muted. There are dark ink drawings of trees on the left and right side of the work, many of which appear to be dead. And then a number of human beings um, with some light to medium uh, coloration. In the background are some unpigmented people of different ages and behind them a few bodies hanging with what looks like Spanish moss. It is a possible gesture to lynching in the US South. All human bodies are naked. There are two foregrounded feminine bodies with long dark hair, both with mouths agape. The central one is next to a huge stone and is also palming a stone that is about to be pitched at the person on the left who is already ducking a first stone. And I wanna mark that these stones all bear um, fairly stark and attentive coloration. Um, so one of the storied matriarchal societies among at least some feminists, and I think that's what Judith was pointing to, uh, feminists who might've been banking on a foundational myth um, to celebrate is one um, from China, the Mosuo or Na people um, from around Yunnan province, which happens to be where my mother is from. Um, a viewer might wonder about Mosuo presence in this work, uh, but also note the lack of clothing the cynical gesture perhaps toward a pastime so past or so mythic that matrilineal society is depicted as prelapsarian rather than something that lives on. It's been hinted um, that this is also a reference to battles between white feminists and feminists of color. So you start to get a sense that this is a really good joke. Uh, one that some feminists might not find funny because that's the joke about feminism. Um, I also want to mention here that there is another work in the exhibition, Karen 2018, a sculpture by the artist Rose B. Simpson, which I also really liked but won't speak about specifically here. But I wanted to note that Simpson is Santa Clara Pueblo, and she has spoken at a different event here at Berkeley about materials supposedly inanimate, such as ceramics, that listen, that witness, in a way of being in the world that she describes as intuitive to her, but which is externally recognized as spirituality. So both her work and her account of material witnessing influence how I can think more expansively about Candice Lynn's prominent rock here. In other words, there's refractive work ha happening among the pieces in the show. Um, and Lynn herself uses natural materials in two neighboring works in this show. 
um, as well as animates certain kinds of chemical and biological intimacies in her other works. But with regard to the stones, uh, we could also talk about geological time, a time in which rock would seem to change its scales that dwarf the time scales of human lives or the time scales of pandemics, a point that is ironized by some accounts of the Anthropocene in which human activity is in fact marked in a geological record. So for instance, the increase in carbon dioxide beginning with the industrial age and beyond now, including that of what we call climate change is deposited or fossilized into rocks in sediment sedimentary layers that stratigraphers will say can be reflected from future geological time. One way to imagine this is as a kind of possibly secular witnessing by rocks or rock worn carbons or a kind of animacy in the rocks for, for whom humans or these matriarchal combatants are mere participants in a much larger action. Judith. Thank you, Mel. So this scene, I mean, I have to say, I love this scene. Um, it, it does strike me as a joke. It's also an historical reality. Um, uh, some truth, I think, is to be found there. When we say it's a joke, we don't mean it's untrue. We mean that it's emanating its truth in a joke form. Um, what is happening? Well, dissension, possibly fatal haunts a feminist debate. Um, but what's new about this um, image of the so-called matriarchal, this, this landscape, um, this image of an originary time, which is not exactly the Garden of Eden, um, is that it's, it's an afflicted landscape. Um, it's one in which the trees are, are, are fading or dying or dehydrated, I'm not sure. Um, and a strange community is, um, is convened, um, as Mel has pointed out, uh, one that is one that, that binds the human figures, the women, um, binds them up with animals and rocks, rocks which are thrown, and rocks which, as Mel suggested, lay about witnessing the fight. They're maybe the chronicler, the chroniclers of a certain kind. Um, the ideal of a peaceable origin, an origin in equality, in consensus, uh, one in which women rule, if that is how we read matriarchy, um, seems not exactly to be the case. They're throwing rocks at each other. Um, matriarchy, matriarchy can be the principle that is supposed to be present in women's communities. Uh, surely not a variant of anarchy where the principle is set aside and not the same as agonism or antagonism. Um, which is far more familiar, uh, I think, both of them far more familiar as modalities of feminist debate. Um, the title lets us know that matriarchy has failed or is failing, that the rule by women is no rule or the life organized by their principle is not peaceable, it's rife with conflict. Set in a natural landscape, arguably primitivized uh, for effect, the the picture plays upon the older feminist desire for a return to a time before men ruled as it destroys the nostalgia for any such time. So what we end up seeing is less a debate uh, than a primeval brawl. Who knows if anyone is actually speaking or arguing or if there are points of view at, at issue. They're heaving stones in the direction of each other. And the open mouths may be voicing cries and grunts and shrieks for all we know. If we go back to the beginning, we find mm, perhaps the women's studies departmental meeting in which insults are thrown and some people end up leaving in anger. You know, happens at all sor sorts of institutions. But here the mediators are surely not called in. They're nowhere in sight. And the scene is frozen, a garden of Eden or a matriarchal garden gone awry. Seems maybe there are at least two points to underscore at this moment. One has to do with time, a hopeful and deluded relation to time where the lost past furnishes ideals of a possible future. In its place, the brutalizing present of feminist dissension on matters of race, sexuality, gender identity, all class all turn out to be part of that imagined scene from the past. 
we're allowed to be neither Arcadian, believing that the past carries all the wisdom we need in moving forward, nor progressivists. Um, indeed, it's not possible to imagine that time is ultimately progressive, that despite various setbacks, all our legislative agenda items will be realized and the cause of justice will be advanced, secured for the future. We can surely hope for such things. We can surely struggle for such things, and we do. But we cannot exactly rely on some schema to produce them for sure in the future. This driving forward without a break does not work so well, creating destruction in its wake, destroying the bodies of those whose lives, in the name of which progress is made. We then, and I hope Mel joins me, we propose failure. Failure, yes, not as a lamentable interruption of inevitable progress, but rather as a way of life, even a queer way of life, lived to the side of norms. And this brings me to a second point um, concerning the word failure. It's not exactly that matriarchy has failed, but rather that the ideal of matriarchy, whatever that was, is no longer plausible, meaning it's no longer desirable. And failure is now given a different value, one that resonates with established work on queer failure, the critique of functionalism and teleology, the value of the errant and mistaken path, the deviation from the norm, the failure to reproduce. Women's violence turns out not to be a contradiction in terms, not at all. Women have no special relationship to nonviolence or to the earth, or so it now seems. And yet the natural landscape, interestingly, is what off offers another configuration of relationality, one that seems to emerge from the minerals and the trees, the animals and the humans. Thank you, Judith. So yes, on, and on that fantastical ecology, the murderous Garden of Eden with a murderous past and present, barely hidden in today's pandemic battles for mask-free occupations of public space. On that note, we thought we would turn to another work um, that got us talking and perhaps also resonated with questions of um, queer failure. And that is My Two Perez Underground. Um, I can't see. Oh, there we are. Um, so I'll hand this back to you, Judith. Okay. I'm trying to think if I can read this, I'll do my best. Um, I guess I'm going to have to uh, pull up a different. Oh. Um, yeah, it's not readable. Yeah, it's not readable um, for me. I'm so I sorry. Think the documents, uh, I think the documents we have should have the text. Um, yes. Okay, let's see if I can do this. Um, sorry, I'm having a little, a little trouble can I, here. Let me know if I can help. We have our little script, but... Um, we don't have to follow it. No, I, I would like that. I'm just not seeing it here. Um, uh, let's see. The text, um, uh, it's under what we're calling part three, Pele's Underground. Right. Oh, it's in, um, it's in my version um, that I... Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, why don't you read it out loud, Mel, and then I will have access to it and we'll be able to discuss it. Um, okay, I can I can begin, but if you um, if you are able to locate your copy, please feel free to jump jump in, or you can just be the one who interrupts me. That sounds fun. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we thought we'd actually read this together, uh, and um, kind of interrupt it as we as we saw fit, um, as we find it to kind of trigger our uh, reflections on the larger themes of, of our conversation. So this is a, a screen print um, from 2007. 
uh, in the ruins of the convention center, they run for their lives, looking for this space which will take them back to their original position. When you rotate the head of the spider, third from the left on the blue lighted panel, a door opens on the inside of her head and she remembers which song to sing. Feral children who seem to have been here forever haunt the underground caves beneath the floating pavilion. I know this because since the first time I came here, I've often tried to enter and been scared shitless by their meaningless moaning. It strikes me that they might be happier than we are. There is something mineral about these creatures who have never received the blessing of instruction. They hang together ups upside down from the ceiling like bats. Or is it me who has simply lost my ability to walk underground? As though you were about to disclose some momentous and yet, or is it and hence, rarely uttered truth, the first time you brought me here, you told me it was something all creatures were born able to do and which I had lost growing up in the anesthetic atmosphere of the city. Clearly I thought this was a lie and another one of your tricks, trying to take advantage of my impressionable mind, deranged by solitude and isolation. Now I'm no longer sure. I would like to return to the surface, but realize that once again, it is but another of those labyrinths you have contrived. Underground beneath the second house, they say there's a secret world of caves, shards of crystal as big as baseball bats hang down from the ceiling. And there is water of a special kind that quenches all thirst and also all desire. And they say you have made up all these stories to placate your followers. Imagine for an instant that the meaning of all the images could be reshuffled and the knife would mean the mother and the rat, the silver chain. Clearly, I thought this was a lie and another one of your tricks, trying to take advantage of my impressionable mind deranged by solitude and isolation. Now I'm no longer sure. When you rotate the head of the puppet, a door opens on the inside of your head and you remember which song to sing. It's, um, it's an extraordinary um, uh, work of art. It is, as we know, um, a, uh, from 2007, and it is a screen print. And as far as I could tell, and I researched as much as I could on the, um, on the internet, uh, my two Perret has, is, the, is the author of this language. She came up with this language. But it is, um, as we can see, a, um, a text that is not functioning as a text. It's on the wall. It's to be read um, uh, against a wall. Um, there is no possibility of uh, leafing through the text um, of seeing what came before or what comes later. It strikes me as interesting that, um, that this work comes to us at this moment. I mean, it was, I believe it belongs to SF MoMA um, and it's been around for some time. And yet it strikes me that it, it has a pandemic resonance for us. I mean, the first thing we learn is that the, um, is that the, the, conf the conference centers have been <laughs> abandoned, that they're in ruins, that, that there are no people there, there are no academics, you know, dressed up trying to get jobs or giving their, their 12 minute papers on uh, James Joyce. Nobody's doing that. Uh, and in fact, um, um, we can see that uh, there are, th there is throughout this, um, this, this uh, screen print, bats, spiders, feral children, um, those who have lost the capacity to walk underground, um, uh, those who, and then a narrative voice, it seems, uh, who is longing to be relieved of city life, city life that kills the, the senses, anesthetic, um, and is perhaps also looking for some original song or perhaps uh, the original position to which the animals were looking to return at the, begin at the very beginning of this text, this picture. Um, there's a obvious disordering of the human world 
and um, perhaps also an invitation to consider life not only through the human access in and frame. Um, uh, perhaps, Mel, you could talk for a moment about whether we could understand this um, um, this artwork, the, despite its author's intentions as a as a queer underground. I love um, I, I love the imagination of the spaces that are created here as queer underground, and I'm and I'm even as we're reading at this time, I'm seeing new dimensions of pandemic. I think the feral children who seem to have been here forever, which is I think already like two perversions of time sitting right there, uh, haunting the underground caves. But they've also they've also become quite mineral in quality, right? These creatures who have never received the blessing of instruction. And you know, those of us in California, but perhaps in any state um, in, in the US and certainly beyond, um, have been privy to the kind of, of frenzy of guardians of children who um, you know, can't wait to put them back into school for the various purposes of instruction, uh, some of which are um, discipline, right? Uh, the removal of virality. Um, the, the queerness comes out through also the mixed forms of address. Uh, I can't keep track of who is you, who is me, who is the spider, who are the bats, who are the feral children, um, uh, who are the shards of crystal, um, what is gravity and how does it work? There is um, a, a kind of dissolution of uh, the individual um, that I find to be a, a certain kind of queer release, like a certain kind of um, uh, a, a queer um, uh, place of certain kinds of queer freedom. So the ambivalence of the text, I wonder what that might've felt like in 2007, right? Um, there was another global economic crisis at that moment. Um, and the other thing finally that I wanted to mention is just that the anesthetic atmosphere of the city um, also kind of, uh, you know, limbs through the pandemic in, in the sense of the, the city becoming um, for at least a number of elite, a, uh, a place to flee for the country, for the freedoms of the spaces of the country, right? Um, so yeah, the ambivalent valences of uh, city and country life, the underground um, uh, and narratives of development, I think all are uh, beautifully rendered for me here. Yeah. And the, the spaces that we expect to be humanly inhabited turn out to be the, the spaces of life for the rats and the bats and, and maybe even the feral children. Um, feral children suggesting that there's something um, that has not been eclipsed of their animality in becoming human. They've, they, they, haven't, they haven't been educated out of animality to become purely uh, hu human. So there is a kind of queer alliance there with, mm -hmm. the, with the spiders and the bats, for sure. And we um, wondered if there were feral children in Candace Lynn's um, work as well kind of yes, that's running through true. the background. Yeah. That's true. I mean, these are both um, in some ways works that are talking about a, a violence that is done um, to the senses and, and the struggle to learn what kind of disfiguration of the human has to take form in order for someone, we don't know who, to find their song. Um, uh, mm. And and that is, uh, that is a question. It's not the human form as it's been established and ratified over and against the animal and separable mm -hmm. from its landscapes. Um, it's rather the, 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 the animate disfiguration of the human form or it's um, the reshuffling of images that allow the human to be coupled with the mineral, the, the bat, the spider um, for feralness. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that is the, the question there. And similarly, I mean, we might have thought returning to Candace Lynn um, uh, that, that a matriarchal return would have been the absence of violence. And yet uh, what we have instead is a murderous encounter um, 
uh, as the origin story. Uh, um, they are not, uh, those women are not, are in their, when they're heaving their rocks, they're not exactly looking for their song to sing. Um, and yet there they are uh, heaving those stones. And as you say, the rocks are also watching, um, occupying a very different um, scale of time than human time. Um, I think perhaps we could say at least midway through our presentation that there's never been anything mild about feminisms in the plural. Right. It's been a life and death struggle from the start. Um, perhaps that's um, its history, its present and its future. Um, we know of the violence done against women and genderqueer people and trans people, femicide, battery, abandonment. Um, but we also know that that violence is not just external coming to us, but also regenerated within, uh, sometimes quite involuntarily. Um, the uh, those, material feminisms and white feminisms and so on. Well, that is that is for sure. And you know, perhaps we can take this as well as a cautionary note when we think about feminism in the 21st century. Let us not make a monolith of that. You know, it's hard to even say that. Uh, it's one thing to say, oh, well, there's feminism in the 21st mm -hmm. century, and then there's the component of race, the component of sexuality, the component of class, you know, this or that as part of that feminism. But why would feminism be the umbrella term for that? Uh, maybe feminism breaks apart uh, by virtue of its own violences and what it also encounters in the world, but also because it's in alliance with a number of social movements that may or may not call themselves feminists. They don't have to be anti-feminist, but feminism may not be the word. Uh, it may not be the only word. So if we want feminism to be the umbrella term, we have to make sure we're not participating in a form of um, cultural imperialism, you know, mild or vicious. Um, yeah, the risk is that uh, singular feminism uh, risks great violence, um, and we always have to be mindful of this. I think so. It, it has to also be one word among, among many. It can't be the only word or the final word or the first word. Um, I think um, Perhaps um, we could also think a little bit about the pandemic uh, in terms of um, in terms of the kinds of interconnections we've been speaking about. Uh, we know that the pandemic has been presented as a um, a disease of the interconnected world, um, uh, exposing, illuminating a global interdependency or interconnection that is inevitable no matter how strong the nationalisms are, no, no matter how strong the racisms are, there is an interconnectedness that, that undercuts those division. Unfortunately, it's an interconnectedness which um, communicates the virus, but it, that virus also illuminates an interconnectedness that is not restricted to the virus. Um, maybe also uh, we can think about the relationship between human and non-human worlds, um, in the in the way that um, that that my two suggests the bats, uh, maybe as uh, you've suggested, actually we can think about the pangolin or the wet markets of China um, as communicators, as vectors for the virus, uh, showing showing this deep connection between human and animal. Yeah, the wet markets, right? They speak to uh, interconnectedness, they, but they also speak to a kind of um, hierarchical, hierarchical um, relation, right? Between consuming humans and animals who will be eaten or used uh, for other purposes. I'm also thinking about if we're describing the pandemic as a disease of global interconnection, um, we should recognize the the primary mover of that form of interconnection, which is global capitalism, as opposed to the diasporas that, that we live with, um, uh, the interconnections of indigenous life, the, um, the interdependencies that are very local um, to life uh, wherever you might look. Um, uh, so the, 
interconnectedness can can sometimes occlude uh, forms of interdependency, and I think we're seeing that in the um, in the in the fairly uh, the troubling approaches to healthcare, to medical remedy for COVID, uh, to vaccination, um, uh, to um, uh, even quarantine and isolation. That seems that seems very true. Um, I wonder if, if we could, uh, talking about global issues, turn um, to Liz Larner's piece from 2019. Sure. Um, which we, we refer to as the Green Woman. Green um, Woman. That is not, yeah, there's Green Woman. Um, this is a piece from 2019, um, and the title is You Might Have to Live Like a Refugee. Um, Mel, do you want to introduce this to us? Uh, so um, let me uh, let me um, get get to the your help. You're doing some uh, invisible time management, Judith. Thank you so much. <laughs> so here we have a, a garish green feminine person in a dress, um, and what this image doesn't show is that the the um, the, the object is about eight inches high, which is a relatively small scale for the show, maybe the smallest scale of the pieces. And it's mounted on the end of a wall divider between two rooms. And it's actually positioned in flight toward that wall divider with the head turned to the right, um, perhaps looking back. And the sculpture is mounted between, I think five and six feet high, I didn't, uh, uh, verify this, but in person it felt like around that height, you know, which might or might not be eye level depending on where the observer is stationed. Um, uh, and you might have to live like a refugee, um, thanks to Julia Bryan Wilson for this knowledge, uh, is a citation of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. You might have to live like a refugee. Beautiful. Um, yeah. I didn't know you were going to do that. That's so good. I'm just feeling it. Just feeling it. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, did you want to speak to the uh, patina on on the on the piece? Well, I mean, it's odd. I mean, the the woman is green, and we read in the uh, curatorial comments that perhaps that's the um, oxidation of bronze, the kind that you find on the Statue of Liberty. Perhaps this is. Um, liberty, the, the tradition of liberty being oxidized uh, or, or, or ruined, but um, Green is also strange. I mean, she's, mm, she's not white, she's not black, she's not brown. What is, what is she exactly? Um, is this a, a post-racial uh, moment? Is, is, are, we, are we greenwashing race, um, perhaps? Um, it is green maybe in relationship to climate destruction. Um, uh, maybe she's a Green Party um, advocate, um, but I, I think that it is um, a bit disturbing since she certainly uh, upon closer inspections looks like she's probably a cis white woman who's running and who has apparently never had to think about the idea of ever being a refugee because she has been settled in place for a very long time. The, um, the title, although perhaps an ironic citation, and, and I'm certainly open to that, you might have to live like a refugee, could that, that, that sentence uh, could only be uttered to someone who has never considered um, that she would ever have to live like a refugee. So we could say, well, climate destruction is going to make refugees of us all or increasing number of people, true, um, that's right. But um, who is the addressee? It must be a museum goer who is understood to be, I don't know, propertied or settled or um, uh, economically enfranchised in such a way, uh, racially, um, uh, privileged in such a way that uh, being a refugee is something other people are or have been or will become, but not me. Um, and there's something uh, disturbing, I think, about that as an address. Why 
is this work of art being made for the bourgeoisie who cannot imagine itself ever as uh, suffering forced migration or displacement or dispossession. Um, it strikes me that it uh, contracts its potential audience in a way that's uh, very disturbing. I confess that I wanted to run from this work the minute I saw it. <laughs> I wanted to run from the running woman. Um, and I, I, I think that, yeah, it, it, um, it does in some ways too little, right, with, uh, with, with, with the notion of, of, of the refugee um, and suspends it as a, as a kind of, kind of non-animate metaphor. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the live like rather than be, you might have to live like a refugee. What, what does it mean to live like a refugee? I don't even know what that means, right? Uh, you might have to be a refugee is a different kind of claim or a different kind of conditional mm. possibility. So the remoteness of, of these possibilities disturbs me too. Um, and it, it suggests to me, right, that, that green in this case does stand for white, uh, maybe of also white feminism. Um, and, I, and I think, uh, you know, when we um, bring this into conversation with other works in, in the show, um, as well as other works beyond the show, um, you know, we, we, we are forced to ask certain kinds of um, critical questions of, um, for me, you know, what you could call a kind of wan cognitive achievement of this piece, right? Um, the, 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 to calculate the simile of living like a refugee, right? It's, it's a wan cognitive achievement um, given the very recent for, for, for Larner 2019 uh, was in the wake of the xenophobic European reception of refugees right, from the Middle East, among them Afghan refugees from an ongoing war, which the US initiated 20 years ago and is reiterating in various ways today. Um, uh, and I think uh, maybe you wanted to mention um, something that's happening in Texas today. Yes, I mean, um, it does strike me that, um, uh, you know, we, we, we do need to think about uh, climate destruction and the ways in which forced migration is happening. But then we, we can also ask, well, for whom has that already happened, either because of climate destruction or environmental toxins or war zones where, where, the, where the soil is completely destroyed. Um, how many people have to leave their countries because of violence or censorship or, um, or military uh, um, persecution, but also because um, the conditions of life have been so massively destroyed through extractivism or, um, or bombing um, that life is not livable on that soil. So what would it mean to to broaden this out so that we could talk about um, forced migration refugees in light of colonial violence and its aftermath, dispossession, extractivism, um, continuing uh, capitalist um, uh, complicity with, um, with colonial uh, devastation. Um, uh, I think that we, uh, we've not yet um, uh, um, we're not yet operating in a large enough framework to take all those things into account. So this figure seems uh, seems narrow, seems somehow um, not not quite there. And and yes, um, we know that there are at least ten thousand people huddled under a bridge in uh, 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 south of the Texas border uh, who are trying to exercise their international rights to be considered as refugees and be eligible for asylum. And they are pushed back and forced to live, live there under the bridge. The bridge becomes their roof. Uh, they're not fleeing, they have fled. They have been moving now for months, if not years, um, many of whom from Haiti. Um, and and, and what, where is their shelter? You know, we talk about gender and and the domestic sphere, it's like, well, that bridge is the shelter, that bridge is the roof, you know? And what is it like for 
men, women, and children to be underneath that roof and, and, and calling that the space of inhabitation and making that a space of common inhabitation. Um, it's part of what I think we need to think about when we talk about new time or our time or the time, the time of refugees, the time of migrants who are systematically deprived of legal, political rights of movement and of transfer and of consideration by legal regimes. They're kept waiting in, um, in, in scenes of detention, sometimes detention centers, but sometimes just out there under the roof or by, 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 the, by the wall or by the fence um, or at the gate. Um, so that seems um, extremely important. I did notice that in the catalog, in the introduction, um, there was this line, we are artists, but everyone who works for the expansion of space, even if it is just mental space, is an artist. Well, that's beautiful, but it can be imperial expansion and we don't want that. But we do want the expansion of space for people to be able to exercise the fundamental capacities for movement and for life forms, human and otherwise, to be able to flourish and to expand. So in that sense, I'm all for it. And I'm, I'm all for, and I think the point that you're making, Judith, and that we're, we're talking about with regard to, you know, this image, which is getting a lot of our kind of weight, you know, our critical weight, but it, it, it is an, a, a helpful example um, of maybe what not to do about new time, right? If, if the condition is set for the future, and if there have been no such conditions in the past, then we're working on forgotten and erased time, time in which the addressee of this work, um, who might well be you know, a settled US resident, um, has played a role in um, displacement and, and you know, the, the forms that, of, of violence that you already described. Um, and that doubles the, the harm in some ways um, that is being done to um, you know, uh, the, the Haitian people at the border. I couldn't help but notice that one of the excuses for beginning to deport um, Haitians from the border, and some of these are uh, diaspora Haitians who haven't been in Haiti for some time. Um, the deportations are um, being uh, described as necessary in part because of quote unquote unsanitary conditions under the bridge. Um, and this, this to me is a very troubling deployment of uh, what, what feel like um, colonial tactics of distancing um, and of dirtying, uh, which have a very long history um, in the colonial history of the US. Um, so for me, this is a really troubling um, combination of events um, um, around the, the border and, and beyond. Mm -hmm. Um, I, um, I see that we have about uh, 29 minutes um, before we end and we, want, we wanted to take questions for about 20 um, of those. So um, perhaps we can, if you agree, Mel, we could, we could talk a little bit um, about um, uh, some of the other paintings briefly and, and maybe um, find, find a way to conclude from there. Sounds um, great, I mean, yeah, let's do it. I mean, I'm also aware that in the catalog, um, which is a very interesting book, um, there's a great uh, discussion with Hortense Spillers about her essay, Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, um, uh, the publication of which I remember um, very clearly. And, um, and she, um, Hortense there says, you know, feminism has become part of the curriculum and, um, and she worries that that's a woeful domestication of what used to be a movement. Um, and, as, and we also see that, that sometimes feminist scholarship distinguishes itself from movement discourse saying, well, this is the this is academic feminism that the movement is different. They write differently, they communicate differently. Um, and a certain kind of divide can emerge between feminism as a, um, an academic, uh, an academic um, 
uh, enterprise and, and as a social movement. Um, and, and Hortense writes, well, there are women in this country today who legitimately wonder what happened to their movement, but it went to the university, to the disciplines with fundraising imperatives and hiring practices. And that's a different animal from the movement, from the polemics that come out of jail time and confronting the police. So what feminism has become is a curricular object that in the living memory of at least one of its generations has a very different source, a movement component. But she also says another thing that I think is really important. So sometimes people come at her and say, oh, well, gender, feminism, maybe it's not so important. We should be talking about imperialism. We should be talking about um, uh, some other broad framework. And she says, look, sometimes if you're coming to me to, and you want to talk about imperialism and you want to stuff gender into that, maybe what you're telling me with the word imperialism is that you don't want to talk about gender and you don't particularly want to talk about black women. Um, but whatever you're thinking about in the world, you have to be talking about black women because there is no subject, she says, that you can speak about in the modern world where you will not have to talk about African women and new world African women. And then she adds, but no one wants to address them. So I'm wondering about this green woman, maybe. Maybe that's an example of not wanting to address them and yet speaking race at the same time. Um, so um, I don't know if you wanna add something to that, Mel. I, um, I just really appreciate your bringing up this um, point. I, uh, I feel like I'm running out of time, but I, um, I had written down a quote from uh, Zakia Jackson's recent book, Becoming Human, uh, that I thought would sort of respond um, to, to your um, identification. Actually, you didn't speak to it, but the, the question of, um, uh, you know, uh, how primary racialization might, uh, what, how, what kind of primary role gendered racialization might have to play um, for um, Papa's um, baby mama's, sorry, mama's baby Papa's movie. Um, Zakia writes, uh, to the extent that blackness is an identity, that identity is not complete in itself. It points to an evolving multiscalar field of inter intra acting systems. This is a reference to Karen Barad's work, human and not human, not a discrete entity or compound. While the structure of blackness may assume a significant measure of coherence, a systematic anti-blackness has certainly enjoyed a remarkably stable telos of redundant and premature death. Nevertheless, it is a telos that in its very iterative structure defers ontological finality. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, share that as a, a kind of response to, to what you brought up. Great. Um, I, I also thought maybe we could, we sort of promised to talk about queer, crip and trans time and uh, we wrote a lot about this and we, we again have run out of time um, in relation to those topics. So I, I don't know, I'm feeling a little responsible to it, but. Um, <laughs> that's okay. Why don't you be responsible yeah. to those topics? Be responsible to those topics, that's okay. Um, maybe, maybe because not. I think, I think it's oh. central. No, no, okay, up to you. Uh, it is central. Um, I mean, I think maybe the, the, the most significant point here is, is that um, uh, single issue political movements um, occlude the massive intersectionalities that are, that are already here. Um, and I would identify queer, trans, and crypt time as um, prevalent and present in ways that defy the kinds of analysis um, that, that come out of top-down uh, single issue uh, political um, imaginations. Um, and I wanted to speak to the, the beautiful collisions of queer, trans, and crip um, being here in Oakland, California, um, in communities that um, have had to defy the majoritarian imaginations of pandemic management. 
um, majoritarian imaginations that are um, most aligned with allopathic uh, medical industrial complex, right? Um, and turn more toward um, the forms of recognition that we have among ourselves and the kinds of um, mutual care um, uh, some sometimes realized as what we call mutual aid um, in, um, in pandemic time. And, and somehow that felt important to register. Uh, these are not marked. Uh, they become marked under certain regimes of imagination for the pandemic. But I think in fact, we need to reverse that scale. We need to be thinking about the prevalence of the underground in which these ways of being with um, our are in fact um, everywhere. I think it's, it's true. And perhaps pandemic time has also um, made clear to us uh, the importance of infrastructures of care, um, care not just as a you know, subjective disposition or orientation, care not just as a maternal ethics, but care as a, as a, as a uh, a, dem a democratic, a radical democratic infrastructure to which everyone should have some kind of access and be able to um, help reproduce in whatever ways are possible. Um, I'm aware that the care manifesto that came out of the UK talks about the de-domestication of care. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact is that so many people have always been reliant on social and public services in order to um, uh, accomplish some of the very fundamental um, actions of life, get, getting out into the street or to, or to food sources or to medical sources um, or finding sociality. There, there are technologies and infrastructures that make movement possible um, and that make it possible in a safe way. So in, in a way, I feel like the rest of the world is catching up with what disability theorists and activists have been saying for a very, very long time. Um, and, 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 uh, and, and are acting on and have been acting on and cannot wait to act on, right? Yes, um, yes. They're not gonna wait until the end of quarantine um, to activate these networks um, or to reanimate them or to strengthen them. That, that, seems, that seems right. Um, and, and I think there, there's, some, there's, a, there's a strong streak of anti-capitalism in this idea of uh, um, a radical democratic commitment to the infrastructures of care, um, everyone and anyone um, uh, um, should be part of a care network. Um, uh, we may or may not be disabled now, but we will be, and um, almost, almost certainly. Um, um, or it may be that, um, that the ideals of ability have precisely been the ones that have um, uh, made us misunderstand human vulnerability, dependency, um, and the, the conditions of mobility and agency, the conditions in the world, the public conditions that we need in order to move, to move well, to breathe, to breathe well. And we are all now aware we need our environments to be safe. We need our environments to be ones in which we can breathe or we can become close to another um, uh, without being imperiled or imperiling others. But we, I believe, um, are slowing down in order to think more deliberately about where we do harm and where we offer care or where we offer solicitude or support. And this is um this is a slowing down of an accelerated economy. It's a slowing down of life. Well, many laments about it, but actually I think it opens up a different way of understanding the world. So maybe this non-market driven form of temporality is part of our new time or our pandemic time. And maybe especially for women who have carried the burden of care. So um, disproportionately it's time that care be de-domesticated and become part of a global interdependency, a global, a globally shared way of life. You know, utopia. And, and a, a, a kind of um, intensified spaciousness, if not an occupation of space or time, but a spaciousness um, for a time that allows these other non-capitalistic forms of care to flourish. Yes. 
Thank you, Mel. Shall we open Thank you up so much, our Judith. conversation? Yeah, absolutely. Y'all, there was so much more we wanted to talk about. <laughs> I know. I know. We'll have to do part two sometime. Uh, so we have um, some questions here. Uh, one is um, moving uh, by um, Jimin Huang, uh, moving slightly beyond the specific works explored in today's presentation. What do you think are the relations between notions of space that emerge through pandemic time? <clears throat> I ask because space and time slash temporality are obviously very interrelated and pandemic time seems to have changed space how space is envisioned, what kinds of spaces are available to which people and why, and how capitalism has impacted these notions of space. Um, do you want to jump in? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that uh, it's a it's a very fine question, and it's a it's a driving question for all of what we're we're thinking about right now. There's there's no question in my mind. Um, I think that um, uh, that we are in the midst of rethinking what is public and what is private, and what is the porous character of that relationship. Um, even for those who did have homes and shelters to which they could return and actually comply with lockdown orders, um, uh, they were dependent on people leaving their homes and delivering groceries or delivering uh, medicines and so putting themselves at risk. And we saw that many people did not have the economic capacity to obey a lockdown order. They had to go out and work. They had to imperil themselves in order to um, make a wage or to supply, um, uh, uh, to, keep, to keep a rent, um, uh, to keep a rent paid. And, and I think that that is a, a hideous choice that so many people had to make and continue to have to make where they must work under uh, dangerous conditions because otherwise they will not be able to provide for life. And yet by working under dangerous conditions, they are imperiling their lives and very possibly the lives of others. So, and you know, we saw this in major corporations, we saw this um, in meatpacking industries, and we saw it, we saw it at Amazon. But you know, it recalls what Marx was saying about capitalism in the early manuscripts, right? The worker goes to work in order to make a living, except going to work is what imperils their life. Uh, and, and that contradiction has now, ex, ex, it's, it's moved into a very contemporary form, but it is there. So I think this is also a time in which anti-capitalism is becoming more and more understandable. We see how people are dri driven to um, open markets do so with a, with a clear understanding that yes, so a certain group of people will get ill. Yes, a certain group of people will die, but that is acceptable. So who, who are those uh, dispensable populations? But I think all of this has to do with space because it's about moving in and out of the home. It's about trying to keep the home by moving out of the home to labor. But also, as we know, so many people who are unhoused don't have that capacity and their governments are pushing them, demolishing their um, at least in the U.S. and in Oakland, right here, you know, the city council every week, you know, lists the demolitions that will happen. So even those provisional structures of home are being destroyed, and people are being put in more and more vulnerable positions vis-a-vis -vis the virus and other other health uh, crises. Um, and you know, I I was telling Mel that you know the the city of Oakland doesn't actually supply, doesn't like to supply, and generally does not supply sanitation um, at various encampments, precisely because it fears that those encampments will become long-term communities with toilets, with running water, with, with, with heated facilities. They, they, they want people to suffer without that so that they will move 
and leave the city. And that is a, that's a, that's a, a nefarious, brutal, death-driven policy. Thank you, Judith. And I, I guess I would add, I'm, um, I'm also reminded of, of just the duality of movements through space, uh, both by your words and also by you know, what I mentioned before, the, the kind of um, temporary migration of uh, certain kinds of elite, um, uh, you know, elite moneyed uh, people to other places uh, that are less condensed, that are less um, less in the, uh, the kind of um, pandemic danger dangers of the city. Um, so there's a, a kind of freedom, freedom of movement or of settlement that is being recognized while at the same time, the kinds of things that Judah speaks to, the, the ways in which, uh, you know, the, the old ways in which um, migration um, across borders um, has favored for so long the movements of capital or labor to support that capital as opposed to migration for other reasons. Um, and, and so under the tensions of, of the pandemic, um, we, we are seeing some reorganization. I'm also thinking just about racialized bodies in space, um, which bodies are continuing to undergo the same kinds or even deeper forms of, um, of um, abuse in public spaces. Um, uh, you know, the murders of black people in the pandemic have not, um, have not gone down in number. Um, and I think uh, um, the, the ways in which um, Asian bodies um, have been racialized in, in, in the public spaces of the US um, are only accentuated, but they were all already here. I'm, I'm always the last person someone, someone will sit next to on the bus. Um, these, you know, these are histories of contaminant uh, or, or you know, contagious bodies that that stick um, to, to racialized bodies um, uh, in ways that, that only are accentuated in, in this pandemic. It could have started anywhere, um, but, but they're still um, often Asian in, in, in some racial nature. Okay. Um, we have a request to take the, the green lady down. Oh. I never remember to stop sharing a screen. Uh, That's all right. Um, I see it now. Sorry about that. Uh, people are asking about um, accessing the exhibition catalog. I would imagine that it, it can be, you know, found, uh, you know, on on the, the website of, of the. Oh, okay. We're going to get an answer. Um, we also have a question on. Um, the disease of interconnectedness. If we interconnect, uh, we get sick. This is from Vicki Frazier. In order for many people to be free from their contained quarantine spaces to explore their queer interrelatedness as scaffolding, where maybe the quarantine space becomes a diseased space, uh, but not COVID disease, so much duality here. I wonder if you can speak to the dreamlike states of online identities jumping out ahead of the real life lifetime adjustments. Wow, there's a lot there. Yeah, somebody has a, an article to write or <laughs> maybe their own talk to give, but I, I wanna at least address one part of that. Um, I, my, my, my sense is that, um, is that COVID-19 is a, is a disease of the interconnected world by which I mean that it's only by virtue of the interconnectedness um, that characterizes this world that a disease like this can go from being a local disease or an epidemic to being a pandemic, that is to say, something that runs through potentially all the people where there's no, no immunity by virtue of, of place or nation or territorial jur jurisdiction. So it's not that interconnectedness produces a disease or that it's a diseased phenomenon. No, I don't think it is. Um, uh -huh. And Mel, I think rightly distinguish between the kinds of interconnectedness that are driven by global capitalism and another sense of interdependency that might be part of a global infrastructure of care. So those, are, those go in different directions um, for me but there's something else in your question um, that I think is 
that maybe we have time to at least um, touch upon, which is um, the, um, the fact that being, on the one hand, being locked in a domestic space, if you're a queer kid, if you're a trans kid, if you're a gender non-conforming kid, you're locked in a family of origin space where you're where you're dead, you're dead named, or you're um, ridiculed, or you're beaten, uh, or you're disparaged, or you find yourself locked inside a room inside of a house that's already in lockdown and suffering massive isolation. I mean, queer, trans, non-gender conforming kids have had a very rough time under this pandemic, and sometimes the the space of the internet is the only space of, of liveliness of community. So, you know, that, that is a, a massive change. So, so on the one hand, we think, oh, uh, the shelter is good. It keeps you safe. Well, the shelter is never good for people who are being beaten up in the shelter. And we know that that tends to be women and children um, uh, and, 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 and vulnerable men of various kind, kinds. So, um, there is a duality, like, oh, which one of these things, which, and I also see, you know, it's very clear that in certain countries like Poland, um, you know, they tried to declare trans free spaces where trans people cannot go out on the street. And if they, uh, if they do, they will be arrested as a public health threat. So now that states are able to sort of regulate spaces on the basis of who's a public health threat or what what is a public health threat they're extending it to regulate people appearing in gendered ways that are that are that do not conform to um received ideas of masculinity and femininity so we are definitely um, seeing a heightened regulation of gender under these pandemic conditions um, that makes public space very dangerous um, um, for, for, for many people. Um, and uh, and, and I'm, I'm seeing a, a rise in that throughout the world actually. And I think any of us who you know, um, teach in universities that have some residential programs um, have been in touch with some queer or trans student who um, in lockdown when they were sent home by the university have been in touch because they cannot go home. Yeah, um, they're living in cars or they're living outside. So it seems that, you know, it's really important, I think, from what Judith has said to uh, understand pandemic time or the, the, the spaces of this pandemic time, which we are still in, in which the world is still in and will be in for a very long time um, as places, uh, as, as times of the intensification of various forms of violence, the intensification of various forms of regulation and the, and the, the withdrawal, the further withdrawal of forms of publics, right? So the ruins of the convention center doesn't necessarily give us anything. Um, uh, we are just understanding um, uh, space to be remapping itself in ways that um, are, you know, quite frightening, um, in fact, and will have consequences, you know, for precisely queer, trans, and disabled bodies. Oh, there's one more question. So Tom's Petty song, Tom Petty song. See, this is what I confess, I never really listened to it, which is why it's remarkable that I sang that yeah, that was beautiful. And in fact, yeah. I've now learned that it was incorrect because Naomi Yamada says Tom Petty's song actually says you don't have to live like a refugee. <laughs> Does that make a difference to your analysis? Maybe mm -hmm. not, you know, uh, if, if, the, if the condition is still like a refugee, then, then you know, I, 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 feel, I, I, I feel the analysis might stand, but Judith. Um, well, um, maybe it's a, it's an indictment. Uh, you don't have to, you, not others, but you definitely don't have to live like a refugee. So let's remind ourselves of your privilege. And yet there she is all greened up running into a wall. <laughs> hard to read, hard to read. Hard to read. Yeah. I, I want, I want to, um, I want also to uh, just make public an important amendment 
here, um, an anonymous listener has uh, reminded me that in Poland, they're known as LGBT free spaces. They appeared in East Southern Poland and are still around. They declare themselves to be free of so-called gender ideology. All this I know. Thank you very much. Uh, there is this question, what do you think is the most important for universities to be conscious of in regards to BIPOC slash queer student discrimination during the pandemic? I, I want to say this, um, that I feel like the rubric of inclusion, diversity, there's another part of that, it's a tripartite thing, that inclusion and diversity are terms that are meant to signal um, the, um, the willingness of an institution, a university or corporation to include people of all colors, of all sexualities, of all genders, but they are, those terms can never describe the struggle for racial justice. They can never describe the struggle for gender justice, for economic justice, or for gender freedom or sexual freedom or the freedom to move in the world supported by infrastructures of care. Um, there's a much more radical um, and hopeful way of thinking about the world we want to imagine and to make. Uh, and some of the, that language of diversity and inclusion, it really cuts it down, it cuts it back. It, 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 it wants to include people in existing institutions, but it doesn't want to think about how existing institutions have to be radically revised in order to be dedicated to the fight, the, dedicated to the fight for racial justice, for gender justice, and um, or for the for or for the 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 long struggle for reparation and recognition on the part of indigenous people or indeed African Americans or diasporic Africans more broadly. So I, Indeed. I think, yeah, I think I think we need to radicalize our our way of imagining, and universities at their best can do that, and at their norm, which is what we're seeing now, are doing fairly poorly. Uh, the inclusion, uh, the gestures of inclusion, are only gestures. They don't reorganize how um, disability, which co locates with with racial marking and in, in, in really important ways that have been. Um, described in the scholarship, they, uh, those, those gestures of inclusion don't become reorganization, they don't become reparation. Um, and I do want to just alert folks to um, doing everything you can please to, um, to prevent the, to, to ensure um, that our BIPOC, queer, trans, non-binary students can stay within our communities. This is actually a more urgent time uh, the time of resumption, the time of reassertion of a certain kind of invulnerable public is precisely when um, their, their um, lives and their presence becomes more endangered. Well, thank you very much, Mel. This was thank a you so much, conversation. It, did, it didn't go exactly as we planned, but I think that's good. You, you have to let things leave their script, otherwise they're just not queer. I fully agree. I loved it. Thank you so much. <laughs> And thank you all for sitting with us. Um, really great to uh, be with you virtually. Thank you so very much, Professor Chen and Professor Butler for this stimulating and illuminating conversation, um, describing and talking about some of the pieces in the BAM PFA exhibit entitled New Time Art and Feminisms in the 21st Century. Because of your very provocative and interesting framings of these pieces. I feel so compelled to go see this exhibit now and I hope those watching this talk do so as well. So don't miss out on that. I want to acknowledge um, that uh, I was unable to provide um, this thank you for your talk during the live presentation due to a logistical and communication error between BAM PFA and Berkeley Arts and Design. And I sincerely want to apologize for that. Um, we really should have acknowledged you live in the moment and um, 
just want to thank you so much for contributing um, to this series. And um, I hope those watching um, might consider watching some of our future talks with arts and design on Monday nights. Thank you all so much.